thought it would be supernatural signs and wonders. But after reading Calvin and all this, I, I redirected my message. I realized that this, this is talking of something far bigger than just, con, just healing the sick or, 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 or walk on water or raise the dead, etc. Now, let me just expound it so you understand. First, Christ is revealed but to only a few witnesses called shepherds and the, and the wise men. God did not make a huge trumpet called entire Roman Empire. Attention, everybody. I have a message for you. My son is coming. No, he didn't say that. The few witnesses. And that too, in the midst of darkness of night. Do you realize it's a nighttime? It's, it's cold. December, year, end, or February, March, whatever. In Middle Eastern, it can be cold too. Again, God passed by the nobles and chose shepherds, persons of humble rank, and no account on that man. That's how God does it. He didn't go for the uh, big celebrity names announcing the arrival of his son. None of those. He chose the hard way. That's God choosing the hard way. Here the reason and wisdom of the flesh must prove to be foolishness. What God is saying that your reasoning and your wisdom of the flesh, your own human flesh understanding and wisdom is foolishness. That's why he said. God is saying you listen to me how I do things, you will learn a thing or two. And so people of God better listen up. And we must acknowledge that the foolishness of God Excels all the wisdom that exists or appears to exist in the world. 1 Corinthians 1.25 For the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. 1 <laughs> Corinthians The foolishness of God is wiser than man. God is saying that there is no foolishness of God. But Paul is trying to give the man a figurative speech metaphor that even if there's such a thing called foolishness of God, that foolishness is wiser than you, your wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. So this is trying to tell you that God chose to bring his son to this world uh, like a few shepherds, a very humble group of people, no, and chose his son to be born in a manger. And all this is trying to tell you that your foolish, your wisdom, your, your, your reasoning does not work. That's why Christians are called to a different way of life. But this too was a part of emptying himself. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of man. Jesus was God, but he did not choose to be on equal terms with God. In Nicene Creed, Jesus is co-equal with the Father, the Son, equal, co-equal with the Father. And he chose to lower down himself, to empty himself, not be count to be with God, a thing to be grasped, empty himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. See, Jesus emptied himself, not that any part of Christ's glory should be taken away by it, but it should be a concealment for, for a time. This is brilliant strategy. Basically, the Son of God concealed his glory. Come into this world with no glory. Walk on earth 33 years with no glory. Shame and spit upon and hate in the end. But he was become so popular, so powerful, they want to be enthroned to make him the next king of, of Israel to deliver them as the Messiah. They were ready to make force him to be the king. He walked away from such glory. He concealed all his glory. Every time he hear someone sick and raise a cripple, for example, the, the word God go crazy. We open the eyes of the blind, the blind man go crazy. He, what, he, did he tell the blind guy? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Every time he said that, why? Because he's concealing his glory for the, for the last, for the end time, for the last one. Again, as Paul reminds us, the gospel is mean. See, some people think the gospel is cheap, it's, 
it's little, not much. That's why it's, it's no big deal, according to the flesh, that our faith should stand in the power of the Spirit, not in the lofty words of human wisdom or human splendor. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 to verse 5. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. This is what's happening. Paul said, my speech is not like total eloquence. People will be marveling at this. But my speech, my preaching, Paul said, my preaching is the demonstration of the power. Demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith might not rest in my, my eloquence, my wisdom, but in the power of God. And mind you, Paul is one of the most mighty preachers of all times. The epistle he wrote is there's just no comparison. And yet he said that. So this inestimable treasure has been deposited by God in the beginning in earthen vessels. See, this is supernatural. That's so why God put this, uh, this, this uh, inestimable treasure in earthen vessels like you and I. For God to put down such mighty deposit of what He regards the best in your life is something. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of joy to show that surpassing power belongs to God and to us. That's supernatural. That is what I'm trying to tell you at this point. We have this supernatural surpassing power belongs to God in us. We are treasures of what? Clay. The language is strong and clear enough to tell us that we are no, we are not to be uh, esteeming ourselves to such high level. We are nobody, basically. We are broken vessels, depravity. But what a what a what an amazing joy that God redeemed us, called us, saved us from the world of darkness and broke us into the church of Jesus Christ. We are whoa, we are clays of jar. We're, sorry, we are jars of clay. Clay, we're made of clay. We're made of, made of diamond. Just very simple, humble human beings is who we are. And God chose to put his surpassing power in this jar of clay. That's who we are. Surpassing. They need another servant to expound it, but it just blow your mind, and essentially. So, if we desire to come to Christ, let us not be ashamed to follow those whom the Lord has put in our lives in order to cast down the pride of the world. How the job is God wants to bring down the pride of the world in your life, in my life. So God's constantly used this contrast metaphor to tell you that even my son, even God, your God, chose to become a humble, humble being, born in a manger, and, and walk with no place to lay his head. And don't cling on to the pride of the world in your life. In order to cast down the pride of the world, has taken from among the dung of cattle to be our instructors. Calvin's words. The glory that shone with the angels to instill in the minds of the shepherds, this is the majesty of God, the supernatural. The angels appear not in ordinary form or without majesty, but surrounded with the brightness of heavenly glory to affect powerfully the minds of the shepherds that they may receive the discourse as coming from the mouth of God himself. That's what we need. We may hear the sermon or read the word ten times, but nothing much has moved sometimes, or sometimes a lot has happened, transformation happened. But God uses a very powerful kind of a, a heavenly glory and shines upon these shepherds. The shepherds really, really get it. This is God. The angels began by saying, by announcing great joy, great joy. And next, aside the, the 
Why great joy? Now that's important now. Why great joy? Because a Savior is born.